the biblical principles of what a church should be and manifesting the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the Hour of Faith, originating from the sanctuary of Faith Baptist Church, Altoona, Pennsylvania, 315 40th Street in the Highland Park section of the city. As you participate in today's broadcast, may the Lord challenge your heart with the of those of you joining us by our media ministries to the Sunday morning service coming to you from the Faith Baptist Church of Altoona, Pennsylvania, the United States of America, and wherever you may be. It's a delight to be able to bring this particular service to you. I would encourage you to go to our website, which is www.fbcaltoona.org, and learn more about our ministry, learn more about our media ministries, how you can keep up with us on radio and television and the World Wide Web. But most importantly, we encourage you to go there to find out ways in which we might be able to minister to you. And Please keep in mind, if you have any spiritual needs, do not hesitate to contact us. You can see there on our screen our phone number. And for those of you listening by radio, it's simply 814-944-2894 as well as our uh, email address and website. It's all up there. And uh, we would encourage you to contact us if there's any way that we can serve you spiritually. Uh, please keep in mind that our best, earnest, most serious desire is that you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And if you've never yet called upon the name of the Lord Jesus and asked him to save you, I encourage you to do that reminding you that, you're, that God's word tells us that we've all sinned and have come short to the glory of God and that the wages, wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, which means to be delivered from sin, its power, its penalty, and its presence through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Please don't hesitate to contact us if you make that decision for Christ or if you would have questions about how you can personally trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. Again, contact us, Faith Baptist Church at Altoona. Uh, Altoona at Juno.com is our email address, and we'd encourage you to get a hold of us as you can or call 814-944-2894. The Word of God has a songbook. It's called the Psalms, and uh, I would encourage you that when you're going through difficult times to spend time in the Psalms. When you're going through glorious times, spend time in the Psalms. Psalm 40 is one of those Psalms that reminds us of how God works in our lives because of his greatness. And we find these words, and I just share them. It says, many, O Lord my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts, which are to us word, they cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. 
If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. Life is filled with difficult days and difficult times. And, and you know, we can truly say that, that life is not fair. But that's what life is all about. But it's great to know that we have a God who is just, a God who is merciful, a God who is loving, a God who is kind, a God who cares for us more than anybody cares for us. And every day he's at work, working in our lives. And how we can thank the Lord for his many wonderful works. And I would encourage you uh, today, perhaps, or sometime soon, just to focus a little bit on Psalm 40 and focus on the works of God and watch how God will be a strength and a blessing to you. Before we sing another hymn, I want to remind you, and I know that some of you get this uh, service uh, quite delayed and some not so delayed, but the Central Pennsylvania Bible Conference uh, will be held here at the Faith Baptist Church on Sunday, October the 29th through Tuesday, October the 31st. It'll be at Sunday morning at 1030 at 6 o'clock Sunday afternoon and then at 7 o'clock Monday and Tuesday night. Our special guest speaker will be uh, Bill Shade. Dr. Bill Shade was Source of Light. He will be speaking on dispensationalism and why dispensations are important to Bible-believing Christians today. I'd encourage you to put that on your calendar Sunday morning at 10.30, Sunday night at 6 o'clock on the 29th of October, and then Monday and Tuesday at 7, the 30th and the 31st. Uh, conference leader will be Jim O'Brien, special music by Kelly Shaw Moore, Marty Walters, Jim O'Brien, and Tom Smith. So we're going to have a great time, and we would encourage you to put that on your calendar and plan on coming out and be involved with us at the Central Pennsylvania Bible Conference. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. Number 590, let's stand and sing this great hymn. And those of you joining us by Media Ministries, sing along with us.
good singing, you may be seated. Thank you, Tina. I encourage you to think of those words, no greater love than this. Think about that. You know, we all know that we're wicked people. We sometimes like to portray to others that we are high and mighty and God's answer to the world. 
But the Bible says we've all sinned and come short to the glory of God. The Word of God also says God demonstrated His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's one thing to lay down your life for a good man, but to lay down your life for a wicked human race is, is just beyond imagination. And that's what Jesus Christ did for us. No greater love. No greater love. And I trust that I trust that you've allowed that song to minister to your heart today and think about what you have in Christ. Let's say together, shall we? John 3 16, I think we all know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Thank God for that. Thank God for his everlasting love. Well, recently we have <clears throat> completed our study in Isaiah chapter 40 under the title of Behold Your God. And what a study it has been, and I trust that it has made a positive impact upon all of our lives, spiritually speaking. If not, it has been a time of waste because we put a lot of time into it. But if it has made one little bit of impact upon our lives, then we give God the honor and the glory for it. And I will admit to you this morning that to a certain degree, I, I've really struggled in delivering the sermons of this particular study for several reasons. Number one, because as a human being, I am so limited. You know that, I don't have to tell you. But I am so limited in communicating the greatness of God as this series would, would require you know, the fact of the matter is, human words in expressing the greatness of God are so shallow. No matter how many words we would put in to try to communicate how great God is, it cannot be properly portrayed. You know that? We just, when we talk about the greatness of God, we just need to allow God through His Holy Spirit and through His Word to show us His greatness. Because no matter how Great an orator may be, even if you had such as the Charles Haddon Spurgeons in the world to speak concerning the greatness of God, it would fall so short and shallow in reference to how great God really is. So I struggled. And every time I came into this pulpit and looked at Isaiah chapter 40, it was my prayer, Lord, just take these words and use them uh, by your Holy Spirit to give us a, an appreciation for how great you really are. It was a concern of mine. I struggled over that to be able to express the greatness of God. Second reason why I struggled in this series is because my desire was to obey God and, and lay out for you the 15 great things about God in this chapter with proper teaching of the text so that it would result in our service, our praise, and our worship to God. And, and, and that was a real struggle. And, and I trust that we have been somewhat successful through this study of these 15 great elements of God in, in chapter 40 of Isaiah. I trust we've been somewhat successful to the point that now you are serving and praising and worshiping God much better and much greater to a greater degree than what you were back before the month of August when we began this series. I trust that there's been some success in that. I trust that it has changed your lives. I trust it has brought you into a greater recognition of who God is and how God works. And then thirdly, I've, I've struggled because I did not want this series to be above our heads to the point where we just blow it away as simply another sermon or, or Bible study. I pray that as we worked our way down through this great chapter that, that the cookies were as they used to tell us laid on the table so that no matter where we were spiritually speaking, we received instruction and understanding from the Holy Spirit through the Word of God concerning the greatness of God. I trust that this particular series has changed our lives, has changed our worship, has changed our praise, has changed our service unto God. I ask you to ask yourself, how has this series affected your life? 
How has it changed your attitude toward God? Because that's what it was all about. Today I want to bring this series to a closure, as it were. Two weeks ago we actually ended the series as it relates to looking at the 31 verses of Isaiah chapter 40. But today I want us to sort of bring it to a closure, as it were, by asking the question, why should we behold our God? That's been the theme. As you recall, it was taken right out of the pages of Scripture from verse 9, where it says, Behold your God. But the question that we need to ask, now that we have spent several weeks and several months' time on this chapter, why should we behold our God, is the question that we need to ask. And some of this closure emphasis today might be a review, but I trust that it will all be refreshing and lead us to the point that daily we will focus on God because of who God is. He is God and God alone. Will you say that with me? He is God and God alone. No other God in the whole history of the universe. He is God and God alone. The question, though, that is before us right now is simply this. Is God your God? Is he? Is he? Number one, have you trusted his son, Jesus Christ, as your personal Savior? If you haven't, I would encourage you to call upon his name today and be saved. Because if you've never yet trusted Jesus Christ, then God is not your God. But then secondly, are you, are you serving and praising and worshiping Him as your God. Only you can answer that. God knows, by the way. Don't, uh, don't try to pull the wool over God's eyes. Because God knows. If you say that God is your God and that you have trusted Him as your personal Lord and Savior, the question is, all right, are you really serving Him and honoring Him and worshiping Him as your God. What happens when you come into a time of praise and worship? Do you really praise and worship Him or, or not? Now, now answer that question in your own heart. Going throughout the course of the day as, as things take place in your life, and, and particularly as you read something from the pages of Scripture, does it, does it change your attitude and, and expression to the point that where maybe, well, maybe you weren't cursing God, but you're angry with God. But thinking of how great God is, it caused you to say, thank you, God, for the God that you really are. Has this study motivated you to get more involved in ministry, more involved in serving Christ? Has this, has this series enabled you to have a better attitude towards God and towards God's people? If it's done none of that, then it was wasted, at least in your life. If it's done some of that, then, God, then God's been honored in your life. What about you? How has it affected you in this study? Today we're going to bring it to a closure. And keep in mind that out of these 31 verses, it was verse 9 that drew us to the whole concept of what this chapter is about, where it says in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 9, and if you don't have your Bible turned to that passage of Scripture, please open it. I know you're, you're very well familiar with it. It says, O Zion, that bring us good tidings, get thee up into the high mountain." O Jerusalem, that bring us good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength. <laughs> lift it up. Don't be afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, let's say it together, Behold your God. Oh, that's not too bad, but let's say it again. 
Behold your God. And as we emphasized in this particular verse, Jerem, uh, Isaiah is calling on Zion uh, and Jerusalem to proclaim to the rest of the cities the good news of the greatness of God. I ask you, do we do that? Have we seen God in such a great stature in this series that Monday through Sunday morning when we run into people, we say, how great is our God? Or do we get our eyes off of how great he is? And don't cry it out. Isn't it interesting? Those three little words there, be not afraid. You see them? Underline them. Don't be afraid to talk about God. O Zion, that bring us good tidings, get thee up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem, that bring us good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up. Let's say those words together. Be not afraid. Oh, on the count of three, one, two, three. Be not afraid. Don't be afraid. To talk about the greatness of your God. We've stated that there are 15 things in this particular chapter about the greatness of God. You know them because we've looked at them. And I'm not going to preach in all of them. I will just mention them. In this chapter of Isaiah chapter 40, it tells us that God is the God who comforts. He's the God who delivers. He is the God who is glorious. He is the God whose word is eternal. He is the God who is powerful. He is the God who provides. He's the God who created the universe. He's the God who is omniscient. He's the God who is greater than all the nations. He is the God who is incomparable. He's the God who is above all things. He is the God who is holy. He is the God who knows his universe. He is the God who is beyond our understanding. He is the God who gives strength. How great is our God? Behold your God. Is he your God? Have you trusted him as your Savior? Are you aware that there is none other like him? Now, we all must admit that God is so great that we will never be able to fully comprehend his greatness. But you see, we, we must take an effort. We must take the time. We must make an endeavor to get to know him more as our life's goal. It seems to me that, that we have a very interesting mission statement at this church. Do you, any, does anybody want to volunteer to tell me what it says? You're, we're good. Is there a cue card somewhere? To know Christ. To know Christ. You see the Apostle Paul, who I believe was one of the individuals of the Scripture who was probably closer to God than anybody else, made the statement in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10 that he wanted to know Him. He wasn't talking about coming to know Him as Savior. He was already saved. But he was talking about getting to know more of God. You see, Paul, the great, the great apostle, the great evangelist, the great missionary, the great church planter, is the one who said, I want to get to know God more. Do you? Do I? It'll change our lives. Behold your God. You know, I always encourage you to get to know the words of the Scripture, don't I? Pay attention to the small words as the big words as well. In verse 9 there, where it says, Behold your God, that word behold is an interesting word and you know, some of the times when you read the meaning of these Hebrew and Greek words, well, <laughs> there's a lot of meanings. They mean numerous things. And it's the context that helps us to understand what that, that meaning is. But, but the word behold here is simple, and, and it's the Hebrew word that simply means to see all over. To see all over. To see all over God. To see all over God means to examine Him, does it not? To see all over God means to look at every nick and cranny as to who God is. And that's the command, that's the challenge. We have God portrayed for us in this book that we call the Bible. And you know, you and I need to allow this book, the Bible, to change our lives to the point that day in and day out, we behold our God. 
And we look at Him all over in every element of who He is. The God of grace, the God of love, the God of mercy, the God of truth, the God of justice, the God of righteousness, the God of wrath, the God of all that He is. Let's behold Him. How many have ever had a baby? Well, man, no, you can't raise your hand, guys. You've been there, haven't you, though, with your wives. And when a baby is born, you know, they take that and look at it. Look at every part of it. Turn it upside down. Turn it around. Examine its ears, nose, and eyes, and lips. Then they try to decide who it looks like. You know who those new babies look like? Themselves. Although we see other people in them, I'm sure. But you know what it means to examine a baby? Look at it. That's how we're to look at God. Behold your God. Just like you would look at a newborn child. See how great that child is that God gave you. I want us to bring this to a conclusion today by asking several questions and trying to answer them briefly. Looking at these questions are not designed to dig into the scripture in depth, but to just get you to think about your God and why should we behold our God. First question is, why did God lead us into this study? Good question, isn't it? Why, why do we look at this study? You know, people come up and say, Pastor Gary, why would you preach on that? And I can, all, I can uh, hopefully, hopefully, I can always say it's because God has led this way. I fully believe that God has led us into this particular study. But why, why really on the practical basis? Well, first of all, God wants us to behold him, does he not? He wants us to exalt him more and more and effectively serve him more and more every day, does he not? So he's led us into this study so that we might be able to see more of his greatness. In addition to that, why has God led us into this study? Well, he wants us to know him. To the point that we, we get to understand to a greater degree. And again, we'll, we'll never be able to understand it all. But he wants us to get to, to know him to a greater degree as it relates to his love and his mercy and his grace and his justice and his truth and all that he is. God really wants us to behold him so that we can get to know him, not to just forget him. I believe that God has led us into this study because God knows that we get distracted and forget Him. Isn't that the truth? We get distracted from God and sometimes forget how great He is. And this is the case of so many of us as Christians. We get involved in the hubbub of life and the circumstances of our, our life and, and sometimes the circumstances seem bigger than God. We get distracted from how great is our God. And so God has allowed us to spend weeks in this 31 verses of Isaiah chapter 40 to be focusing on how great He is so that we don't get distracted and don't forget Him, but live according to His greatness every day of our lives. And certainly I believe that God led us into this particular study so that we, we might learn to worship Him and praise Him and, and serve Him in a Genuine fashion. Not just outwardly, but inwardly. And when we come to the point of beholding Him as He is, we will worship and praise and serve Him in a genuine fashion that will bring glory to Him. I think sometimes God is disgusted with us when we just go through the motions and don't really portray the truth in our hearts and in, in our worship and praise and our service as to how great God really is. We need to get to know Him. And we get to know Him by beholding Him. Behold your God. Back in 1979 or 80, when we first went over to Kenya, I had a Kenyan come up to me and said, 
You're from the United States of America, correct? I said, yes. He said, well, do you know Jimmy Carter, our president in those days? I said, well, I know he is, but I really don't know him personally. And you know, some people as Christians are in that condition. They know who God is, but they have never really studied the nick and the crannies and the greatness of Almighty God to say, yes, He is the greatest of all. They know about Him, but they do not know Him in His greatness, in His power, in His wonder. The King of kings and the Lord of lords, the Almighty God, who is holy, holy, and holy. Get it? Because we haven't really beheld our God. Second question is, what keeps us from beholding God? Did you ever think about that? As we've gone down through this series over the past weeks, what has kept you, what has kept me from really seeing God in the great element that He is, particularly as it is brought out in these 15 things? And by the way, the 15 things that reflect the greatness of God in Isaiah 40 are not all the elements of God's greatness in the Word of God. If we would really want to know what all the elements of God's greatness are, we'd have to spend time in all of God's Word. Amen? Not only in one chapter of one book, but Genesis through the book of Revelation. All 66 books and all verses and all chapters in all of these books are those that show us how great is our God. And you see, I know people that are those who say, I just stay in the New Testament. Well, you know what you're missing? You are missing a super abundant amount of God's greatness by just staying in the New Testament. You need the whole Word of God. And so these 15 things that we brought out in in this 40th chapter of Isaiah is just the beginning, the tip of the iceberg of the greatness of God. But what keeps us from beholding Him? Allow me just to mention a few. And again, remember, this is just designed to get us to think. We're not going to delve into any one of them in detail. Number one, what keeps us from beholding God is a lack of interest in beholding Him. A lack of interest. Ooh. We just don't care how great He is. How have you approached services? How have you approached the Sunday morning church service when we've been looking at this great series? How great is our God? How, how have you come into this service? How have you come into this sanctuary? Have you come into this sanctuary with the intent that you want to see some more of God's greatness? Or were you indifferent and just didn't even care about it? Didn't care if you came or not. Hey, we're studying about how great God is. Oh, well. That is the beginning of keeping us from beholding God. I think that there's another uh, item that keeps us from beholding God, and that is a lack of effort in beholding Him. We just don't take the time. We don't try to, to see how great God is as He's revealed in the Scriptures. This morning I spent some time in Psalm 40, and of course you know I shared that with you when we welcomed our media audience. Take some time to read down through Psalm 40, and it it reminds us of the greatness of God. In verse 3 it says, He hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God, (laughs) because He is so great. Psalm 40 speaks of the greatness of God, but also the weakness of us. The last verse says, but I am poor and needy. Anybody here who's poor and needy today? If you, if, if you don't say yes, you're telling a big fib. Don't do it in church. We're all poor and needy. I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinketh upon me. You, you say, I know how poor and needy I am, but God really knows how poor and needy we are. And yet he thinks upon us. And it says, thou art my help and my deliverer. Make no tarrying, O my God. And as I looked at that, I thought, hmm, hurry up and deliver me, God. Amen? 
But you see, the fact of the matter is, we need to take an effort to behold Him by looking in His Word and and allowing His Word through His Holy Spirit to become a reality to us. There's a third reason why sometimes we don't behold God, and that is because of the lack of a biblical worldview. This past week I spoke in a... In the, in the revival service over in western Pennsylvania, praise the Lord, we saw five people come to Christ and other decisions were made for the Lord. But one of the evenings I spoke concerning the concept of the biblical worldview. Unfortunately, many of us as Christians have a secular worldview, don't we? We look at things through the eyes of the world, through the eyes of CNN and Fox. You know what? I am going to blow up my television one of these days when watching these newscasts. I don't care if it's CNN or Fox. I get so angry I could kick the crazy TV anymore. I ought to confess my sin here. I just sinned, didn't I? I'm out of control. I, don't you get disgusted with it? You see, it's what we see on the news. And, and, and yes, you've heard me say, the Christian needs to have the newspaper in one hand and the Bible in the other, right? We need to know what's going on in the world. But I'll tell you what, whatever we see going on in the world, let's put that aside and put God's Word in the center of it. Let's make sure that we have a biblical worldview, seeing it all through the eyes of God's Word. But many times... We don't do that, and thus we don't behold the greatness of God. I think there's, there's another thing that keeps us from beholding God, and that's a sense of personal pride. We think there's nobody else like me. Well, that's true, but maybe not in the way you think. Over and over again, the Bible tells us that pride comes before a fall. Holy Spirit comes before a fall and pride comes before destruction. Pride will bring us down and pride is not a good thing, but pride keeps us thinking, I can do it myself, right? Come on. Whatever the circumstances, I can get through this on my own. You want good news? Here's an alert. You can't get through anything on your own and neither can I. And the sooner we learn to realize there is a God who can get us through is the moment we will get through and we will get through it by His strength and for His glory. But it is pride that keeps us from beginning to wanting to know about how great God is. I can do it myself. No, we can't. Another thing that keeps us from beholding God is a focus on material and worldly things. Having earthly ambitions, earthly hopes, and earthly dreams that are apart from God. Now, it doesn't hurt to have a, an earthly hope and an earthly dream as long, as long as God's in the center of it. Do you understand that? As long as God is in the center of it. Because when God's in the center of it, listen, you might have a, a dream about this earth and about this world, whatever it may be. You know... If, if you have a dream apart from God, it's going to end up in the flop. But if you have a dream with God in the center of it, it's going to be greater than you can even imagine. But we need to put God in the center of it. And not just have ambitions that are selfish and worldly and godless and material. It gets us going down the wrong path. By the way, that is the path of destruction. And sometimes we don't behold God because we have an overwhelming awareness of life's issues. And I know in my own life, sometimes it's the burdens of life that get me down and keep me from seeing the greatness of God. Anybody else like that at all? (laughs) Had people come to me and say, Pastor, you never get discouraged, do you? No. The greatest preacher of all, probably, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Discouraged, depressed, and left this life before he was 60 years of age. Probably, perhaps, that discouragement, depression led to that. I don't know. Could be. Other than the fact that he went in God's timing. But preachers get discouraged. And sometimes we who stand behind this sacred desk and tell you how to be focusing on God are the ones who 
Don't do it so well either. So we must be careful not to allow the overwhelming awareness of life's issues get the best of us. You know, we really need to work on beholding God, don't we? And you know what? Let me put it another way. We really need to work to miss how great God is. You hear that? We really need to work on, on, on missing how great God is because he's everywhere doing everything in our lives. If we, if we are missing the greatness of God, we are spiritually blinded, which means we're unsaved, by the way. I mean, we have just almost got to say, no, God, get away from me, God. in order not to be able to see his greatness. It's everywhere. I'll touch on that in just a moment. But that leads us to the third question, which is why should we behold our God? And I go down through these rapidly. Number one, from God's perspective, we we should behold him because God told us to, right? Did he tell us to? Where did he tell us to? We're at in God's word. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 9. Oh yeah, he did. Through Jeremiah, he said, Behold your God. Those aren't just the words of Jeremiah. Those are the words of God. Amen. And God said to every one of us today, from the time those words were written, You behold your God. So you see, the reason why we need to behold Him is because He told us to. Amen. So not beholding Him is what? Sin. Not trying to see the greatness of God and and observing how great He is is the sin of all sinfulness because the more we realize how great God is, the more we will be worshiping and praising and serving Him. Do I hear an amen to that? So God told us to from His perspective and, and when we behold Him, He is certainly glorified, which should be our desire. But what about from our perspective? Why must we behold God? Well, number one, because we have such a limited knowledge of God that we need to learn more. Amen? Amen? Is there anybody here that knows everything that there is to know about God? If there is, I will pay for you to be on Fox News or CNN and tell the world. But you see, the Bible tells us that it's going to take us an eternity to learn about His grace in Ephesians chapter 2. If it's going to take us an eternity to learn about His grace, what about the rest of His greatness? The fact of the matter is, we have a limited knowledge of Him and we need to learn more about Him and that's why we should behold our God. Secondly, we need to learn more about how He works in our lives because you see, the more we understand how God works in our lives, the more we will be able to have confidence in Him even in the midst of the detrimental times of life. If we don't know who God is and don't behold Him, then as we are going through those difficulties of life, we're going to say, does God really care? Can God really work? Is is God really going to keep His promise? And if you'll admit the truth, you'll say that there's been times in your life where you've said, is God going to keep His word? But the more we behold Him, the more we realize He will. From our perspective, we should behold Him more because we we need to trust Him more. You see, trusting the Lord is the key to life. Uh, Dr. Chris is speaking on Wednesday night on what pleases God. What does not please God? The lack of faith. Without faith, right? Without faith, it's what? Impossible to please God. And living the life on earth is trusting God more. And the more we learn about Him, the more we will trust Him. That's the key to life, so we need to behold Him more. We also need to behold God more so that we will not be distracted by the other things of this world. That's why the song says, Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full at His wonderful face, for the things of this earth will grow what? Strangely dim. Not just dim. Terribly, strangely, awesomely dim in the light of His glory and grace. 
We need to behold God so that we can sense His great comfort. We need to behold God so that we can focus on God rather than other people and things that Satan will use to disrupt our spiritual life. Do you know Satan wants to disrupt your spiritual life? He'll use other people, places, and things to do that. We need to behold our God. And we need to behold Him so that we can see Him in His greatness in order that our service and praise and worship will be more genuine as He desires and as He deserves. Behold your God. Are we doing it? The final question is, how can we behold our God? Well, first of all, it starts through having a personal determination to do so. You know you'll never behold God if you don't decide you want to behold Him. Can I hear an amen to that? Okay, everybody look at me. Uh, You all ought to stand up here and preach sometime. People are looking here, people are looking there, people are looking down, people are bending over, people are straightening up. Just look at me for a moment. We will never begin to behold God until we determine to do so. Is that your determination? Secondly, how we can behold God is through the study of His Word. We've done that in Isaiah chapter 40. I I don't have the time to go over to Isaiah chapter 45, but I've been spending some time in Isaiah 45 this week, and, and I would encourage you perhaps to do the same. But as you go down through Isaiah chapter 45, it speaks of all the great things that God is going to do. And at one particular point in verse 5, it says, I am the Lord and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none else beside me. I am the Lord and there is what? Say it with me. None else. And so it's through the study of His Word that we get to behold God and understand how great He is. If we don't determine to be in God's Word and then if we don't Focus on God. We'll never get to know who He is. We'll never behold Him. There's a third way that we can behold the greatness of God, and that's simply by observing His works. We talked this morning from uh, from Psalm 40 and verse 5 that says, His works are more than can be numbered. But you know, there's another way that we can behold God, and that's just through viewing His creation. Psalm 19.1 says, The heavens declared the glory of God. You see why I said earlier that to deny Or not to see or not to behold God, you've got to be blind. He's there. He's the one who made the trees. He's the one who made the grass. He's the one who made the mountains. He's the one who made the stars. He's the one who made the universe. And because of all of this, we see His greatness. But then when we get in His Word and learn from His Word how great He is and learn from His works how great He is, we see that He is God and God alone. And if that doesn't change our lives, nothing on earth will. What a God. Is he yours? Are you beholding God? Be totally honest today. Are you beholding him? Has this series in Isaiah 40 changed your life? Has it brought you to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ? Has it got you to understand how great God and God alone is? Be honest. Are you this minute beholding the greatness of Almighty God? I will tell you personally, seeing the greatness of God is the only thing that will get you through the difficulties of this life. Nothing else will. Are you beholding God? Be honest. If so, praise Him. If not, then why not? (laughs) He's the God who's to be beheld. And as we draw this series to a closure... Encourage you to make a personal determination right now, not tomorrow, but right now to turn your eyes upon God every moment of every day so as to see His greatness and then praise Him and worship Him and serve Him as He desires and deserves to be praised and worshipped and served. Oh, everybody look at me, please. Don't miss out on the greatness of God. 
Behold your God. Make sure you know him. Through faith in Jesus Christ. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ as Savior, I would encourage you right now to call upon his name. Say, Lord Jesus, I trust you to save me. And guess what? He will. He's promised it and he will do it. So trust him as your Savior. Be saved. Be born again. Have, have that sin forgiven in your life that blurs your vision of God. And then as a Christian, make that determination. To behold him. That'll do more for your life. And anything this world has to offer. God. God alone. Behold Him. Behold your God. A while ago there was a song written entitled God and God Alone. I believe it's a very appropriate way to bring closure to this series. Let's focus on the words and the sound of this great hymn, God and God Alone. participation in our worldwide broadcast of the Hour of Faith, which originated from the sanctuary of Faith Baptist Church, Altoona, Pennsylvania, 315 40th Street in the Highland Park section of the city. Dr. Gary G. Dull and the family of faith welcomes you to Sunday School at 9.30, morning worship 10.30, Sunday night service at 6, with youth programs and adult prayer and Bible study Wednesday at 7, with Kids for Truth every Wednesday night at 6.30 during the school year. If we may ever be a further spiritual help to you, please call. 814-944-2894. Log on to our website, www.fbcaltuna.org. We'll write to the Faith Baptist Church at 315 14th Street, Altoona, Pennsylvania, 16602 USA. Till the next time we meet, may our Lord richly bless you as you serve Him.